Please pray with me. Lord God, Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our salvation. Amen. I'm not sure, I tried to do the math this morning, I'm not sure how many times in 47 years of ministry I've preached on this text, but I figured if it comes around every three years and divide three into 47, that's what, 14, 13, 12? 12 times on this, let's say I preached on this text 12 times. Math is not my thing when I'm standing up here in front of you. <laughs> And every time I looked at this text, and every time this text comes up, it comes up at this time of the year. The word eschatology, the word end times, it's always one of the last lessons we get as we are ready to close out the church year, and we're getting ready to start a new year. And you remember last week, I challenged you on the bridesmaids, and I challenged you to see something different in that text that was not traditional in that text. And this morning as I was looking at this text this past week, I knew what I could preach on on this text. I could put you all on a guilt trip because that's what Jesus wants you to be on. He wants you to be on a guilt trip. You've got talents, you don't use them right, you're in trouble. And at this time when it's stewardship in the time of the church, what greater way to put you on a guilt trip than to say, if you're not good stewards of what God has given you and you're not giving back to the Lord what he thinks you should have, you're in trouble. You're not living up to what you should be. Sound like a good sermon, right? Have you heard one like that before? I probably, if somewhere in my ministry, have preached that text before like that. Similar, not that guilt-ridden, but reminding us we have tech, we are given gifts, and that we should use them, being good stewards. But something jumped out at me this past week in this text, which I guess in 47 years I never paid much attention to. And believe me, it does happen. You can look at the text over and over and over again. You can hear the words. You can study the words. But sometimes, and I believe this is the power of God through the Holy Spirit, brings you to something that you probably have read time after time after time. And suddenly, oh, maybe there's more to this then meets the ears and the eyes. In the text for today, I guess I've passed over this verse, starting at verse 24. It says, He who also had received the one talent came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, Reaping where you do not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Let's put this thing into perspective. The whole concept of talents in this text is wages. And I want you to hear what this Master is giving to his servants wages, an advance on salary, more than they could ever, ever imagine they could do anything with, whether it's the five talents, the two talents, or the one talent. In fact, some people, in some of the readings I had done, even the one talent is a lifetime's worth of salary, imagine it. This master is generous. Even to the one, he gives far more than no one can ever even imagine. So you can imagine what it must have been for the one who had five or the one who had two. There is a picture here that I sometimes think we miss. It's the master who gives the gifts. It's the master's gifts to the individuals. 
It's the master who lives to give for others. I think in this eschatological picture, Jesus is painting for us a picture of God in our lives. More than just talents and stewardship, but probably because in a couple of weeks, when there's two weeks off, we're celebrating a day called Thanksgiving. And even with all the changes that might happen this year in terms of gatherings, etc., what is the premise of Thanksgiving? The premise of thanksgiving is giving thanks for the gifts that we have. And I believe that's the struggle in this text. Far more than just the stewardship. Far more than just did you use them right and did you multiply what you have. But I think that one line says something to me about the whole text. Master, I was Afraid. What? I just gave you more than you could ever imagine. I just gave you, even you with one talent, I just gave you enough salary, enough to live on for the rest of your life. And you were what? Afraid? I'm beginning to think that part of the struggle of this text is our perception of God. I don't know if you listened to the lessons for today, but if you go back through the whole scriptures and you begin to look at the time of the, the fall of Israel in terms of moments when they were weak, you can go back to the desert and the wilderness, and you can go back to the battles they have. When is it that they lost? It's when they lost their perspective in whom God was. A loving and caring God. Start back in the book of Exodus. Well, start even farther back. Start back with, why did God choose Abraham? He wasn't exactly the best example to choose. He worshipped idols. Why did he choose him? Those of you that have ever taken crossways know that it was just because. But just because is God's love. Mercy. He's a loving God. From the very beginning, he was a loving God. He created all things. And remember how the Genesis says, and it was good. I think Jesus is reminding us in this text to have our perspective right about whom God is. Think about it. I said to you, I read that one line and I have read it many times over and I looked at it and I heard it and I preached on it and I said, well, yeah, you were afraid because you knew what was demanded of you. No, it wasn't that at all. That that servant with one talent, more than he could ever imagine in life, had the wrong perspective on God. He said, I knew you, were, you, you, you did bad things. I knew, come on, folks. Is that our God? Is that the one who provides for us every single day? Is that the one who gives us all that we have in spite of ourselves? Is that the one who sent his son to die on the cross for you and for me? once and for all? Is that the God who is going to zap us? You see, we're coming to the end times. And I challenged you last week when we looked at the the virgins, the whole bridesmaids, that we don't know when he's coming, but we need to be prepared. And how do we prepare? We begin to use the gifts God has given us to care and to support and to be 
his children in this world. And I think that's the crux of this text. Far more than stewardship, far more than God has given you 20 gifts, 30 gifts, 40 gifts, how have you used them? Yes, you need to use them, but why? Let me go back to the book of Exodus. Before the Ten Commandments are given, there's a line in there. You better go back and read it in Exodus chapter 3 because too quickly we skip right over it and we get right to the commandments. Before God gave the commandments to his people, he said, I am the Lord your God who delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians. And there's a simple little phrase, word that's in there. Therefore, you shall. That's the same God that in this text gives out the talents. Did you notice there was no qualifications on the talents, was there? He gave them out. Everybody responded to them by what their perception of what should be. The one who had five, perception. I've been blessed, I'm going to make more. The one with two, I've been blessed, I'm going to make more because I know this loving God or this loving master who has given this all to me. The third... I am afraid. And you know what fear does? Have you ever been afraid? It shuts us down. It doesn't give us the perception to see what's happening. It closes us off. It causes us to react from emotions rather than from realizing what gifts we have, what we are blessed with. And so it did with this one man. His whole perception of the master ruined everything. What about us? How do we see him? We've all been blessed far more than any of us could ever imagine. You know, my favorite Thanksgiving hymn, count your blessings, name them one by one. And I thought to myself, if I ever did that song, and I've, ever, I've never stopped counting. See the perception Jesus is trying to paint here in this eschatological painting? It's not just about stewardship. It's far greater than that. How do we see the one who gives us all that? Are we afraid of him? Do we think he's going to zap us down? You know, in the, in the times of the dark ages, and in, the, in that period of time, they had God sitting on the throne. And in one hand, he had lightning bolts. And in another hand, he had this great, object that he could beat you over the head with? Is that the God that sent his son into the world to suffer and to die for you and for me? I think Jesus is painting a picture for us to understand a God who loves us beyond anything you and I can ever imagine, who loves us beyond anything we can even begin to comprehend in our lives, who loves us how does it go? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And don't forget the next verse. For God did not send his son into this world to condemn this world, but that through him this world would be saved. That's the one who gives the talents. That's who gives us what we have in our lives. 
How do we respond? Love, care, reflecting, for you see, I reflect, see the other two reflected exactly what they knew about the master. Or are we afraid? There's another Bible verse. Perfect love drives out fear. Well, I hope it gave you a little another view on this text today. See one little phrase, I was afraid changes the whole picture. And I hope in your heart and in your mind, don't be afraid. How does he say it at the end of Matthew? For lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. Well done good and faithful servants, reflect in your lives my love for you. That's the eschatological picture. God's love for you and me. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, Keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus now and forevermore. And all God's people say, Amen.